is a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing Dr. Nick Yanyos all the way from Rogers, Arkansas. And uh, my gosh, I was so excited that you joined our show today. You started out as an aeronautical engineer turned microbiology major, Texas A&M University, then University of Texas Health Science Center, 93 grad, practice in Dallas, 93 to 94, then practice in Branson, Missouri, 95. My God, that town exploded. Now yep. practicing in Rogers, Arkansas, 2015 to present. Um, Board of Directors uh, Academy of CAD CAM Dentistry, 2008 to 2009. Co-author, textbook, chapter contributor, first edition textbook on digital occlusion, handbook of research on computerized occlusal analysis, technology applications in dental medicine, director, soon to be launched, Center for Neural Occlusion, and discover of frictional dental hypersensitivity. Um, so my first question to you is, uh, what is uh, neural occlusion and what is your Center for Neural Occlusion CNO? What's, all, all, what's that all about? Well, it's kind of like this. Uh, when you and I graduated dental school, um, training in occlusion, TMD, and what have you was, you know, pretty much fraught with error. There wasn't much learned there. So over the years, I'll tell you a quick story. About 10 years ago, I started getting deep into CAD CAM dentistry. And I started realizing that even though I was dialed down to about 40 microns tolerance, I was still having issues. I was creating restorations that were more accurate than what the lab made me, but still I had issues. So... I knew there had to be a better way. And all of us are using bite paper, shim stock, and all that kind of stuff. So at the time, I was on the ACCD, the, the CAD CAM Dentistry Board. And that year, we happened to ask Robert Kirstein to come speak with us. And Robert was up there, and he was talking about the T-scan. And, you know, Robert's got kind of a – he's a great guy, and he's super smart, and he's a hell of a good researcher. But some people, they don't like what he has to say because it invalidates what they're teaching. So anyhow, I was listening to him speak, and I'd heard of him before. And – I basically embraced the T-scan, the digital mm -hmm. occlusal analysis stuff. And to accelerate eight years later or so, over the years, I basically have used that to great effect. And I've kind of pushed that out for the world to see with the YouTube videos and what have you. And what neural occlusion is, it's basically a screening protocol whereby we measure all sorts of things that normal dental world has no clue about before we decide to um, initiate, say, occlusal adjustment therapy. And it does not involve splints. It involves measurement technologies such as MRI, CT, T-scan, EMG, uh, joint vibration analysis, and other technologies we're using to basically track what the joints are doing before we touch what the front side, the teeth themselves, are doing. So it's all related. So, so many times we've all heard occlusion has nothing to do with TMD and vice versa. That is a crock. It's untrue. And I measure it every day. And... I'm having a hell of a good time doing it. I'm becoming passionate about it. I love helping people. And basically neural occlusion, the center for neural occlusion is my way of passing it along. I'm trying to get the profession, not just dental, medical as well, up to speed on what measured technology can do for the TMD patient. You know, I think um, TMJ or TMD or a cranial mandibular, um, it, it's got to be the more uh, controversial uh, segment dentist. I mean, it seems like most dentists will agree on bonding agents, amalgam, composite. But man, when you get into your arena, uh, it is fraught with controversy. And the podcasters, the, they're pretty much all under 30. We're, we're in our 50s. They're all under 30. And yep. their specific question they're asking uh, me at Howard at Dentaltown.com is, I feel like I didn't learn uh, much about occlusion in school. I want to learn more. And there's all these different camps. Some call themselves neuromuscular camps like LVI. Some call themselves CR camp like Coys and Spear Center and Scottsdale and Panky and what have you. Um, what would you tell? What would you tell a young thirty-year-old lady who wants to learn more of occlusion? And there's neuromuscular, all, all these different camps. How, how does? And she doesn't have the money or the time to go to all these camps. Sure. She's got three hundred thousand dollars of student loans. What would you recommend for someone who wanted to continue their journey to learn more about occlusion? Two words, measured matters. When you start trying to get into this arena, realize that if you can put a number to something and you can reproduce it objectively, that's a fact. If you can't, that's an opinion. It's subjective. So what we're trying to proffer here, what we're trying to teach, 
is ways for individuals like the 30 year old female with $300,000 of debt can try to get a better handle on how she's treating the occlusal case and whether or not there is a TMD issue that's contributing. If it's muscle only, if it's orthopedic as well, if there's a neurological component, if there's a surgical, or excuse me, a cervical component. And here's another quick thing that's kind of heady. In dental world, we all think about the trigeminal nerve, the cranial nerve, fifth, right? What if I told you there's a lot of sympathetic input? In other words, autonomic nervous system that we're dealing with here. And the CNO has various levels. We're creating a level zero, one, two, and a three. The level zero is basically the very basic level that's going to be up online within a few weeks where we're going to be um, addressing physicians, chiropractors, dentists, students, whoever, just giving them a basic introduction into what uh, TMJ or TMD really is. And then the level one is more of a didactic um, introduction to occlusal adjustment ther therapy, specifically what's called disclusion time reduction, Robert Kirstein's DTR therapy, and how effective that is at shutting down hyperactive muscles of mastication. And, and it's not a panacea, nothing is, but we're trying to teach when to use it, why to use it, when to avoid it, and things like that. And then the level two is basically – after level one is completed, one takes an exam, and once they pass, they will move on to level two. Level two means someone like Dr. Kirstein himself flies in to see the doctor and watches them work on at least three of their own patients to make sure they're proficient at the usage of the technologies involved, plus um, case selection. And then the level three happens in the CNO headquarters, which is basically my practice in Arkansas, where we're trying to teach people how to order MRIs, read them in the basic sense, understand what goes on with the interaction between the, the dentist and the radiologist, the CTs, how to measure growth and development, all these types of things. So we're trying to make it in an affordable, scalable manner is the bottom line to answer your question. So you have two websites. You have drnickdds.com. Right. So www.cnotmj.com. Uh, explain to my dentist uh, homies what is the difference between those two websites. The Dr. Nick DDS website is basically my practice website. Um, that's the normal, general, you know, my, my, I don't know, my doorway to the world, basically for my own practice. The cnotmj.com, that is the Center for Neural Occlusions website. That is basically... Over time, we're going to introduce the various levels of training and all that, and that's where an individual would go to learn more about the CNO. So, so is DrNickDDS.com more your B2C patient website and CNOTMJ.com your more B2B dentist-to-dentist website? Well, CNO is also going to link uh, patients to other doctors. We're going to make a marketing push um, to basically connect patients with people that have learned the CNO philosophy or whatever you want to call it. I hate the the word camp or philosophy, but um, that have been trained in, in ways of measured occlusal, occlusal matters, basically. So it's the, the CNO TMJ portal will be for patients and doctors alike. Okay, my job is to ask questions. Um, all these homies, most of them, about 85% tell me that they um, listen, they have an hour commute to work. That's why we, there are shows an hour. And, um, and I, so they're all individuals, uh, they're all alone when they're watching this. So my job is to ask questions. So I'm going to ask you a lot of questions that I'm trying to predict their thinking. What is disclusion time reduction? What is DTR, disclusion time reduction? What do you mean by disclusion time reduction therapy? It's basically a timed and measured event. In other words, the disclusion time is the amount of time. Okay, let me, do, let me say it this way. Let me put it real simple. When a patient bites down or I bite down into MIP, habitual closure, and then I commence an excursion, let's say to the right, and I go out to number 27 hits number six, that's a right excursion, okay? So basically, with DTR, we're measuring the instant whereby we're leaving MIP until the instant that we have discluded off of all of the posterior teeth bilaterally. So if I'm going right, I'm off my balancing contacts, I'm also off my working. So the amount of time it takes me from commencement of excursion to where I no longer have posteriors in contact, that is called disclusion time. Kirstein's research has shown for almost 30 years 
that if it takes longer than 0.5 seconds to disclude off of your posteriors, there is a commensurate hyperactivity in the muscles of mastication. So in other words, the muscles can be pissed off, statistically speaking. So when a muscle gets pissed, what happens? It becomes ischemic. If you're overworking, if you work out too hard, tomorrow you're sore. You're sore because your muscles can't get enough oxygen. You're building up excess lactic acid and what have you. So the goal of DTR therapy is to reduce those frictional engagements that slow things down. When you reduce that amount of time that you're on the back teeth, myalgic symptoms, muscle-related symptoms, will typically abate, provided, and here's the last key, provided that you have stable and adaptive TMJs. That's key. Okay, so that's, you, this is tricky. Okay, you were using the term MIP. Explain that. Maximum interpestation, the way our teeth naturally come together, our best bite, or the old, in our day, the old CO, centric occlusion. But nowadays, they've, they've kind of changed that term. MIP, basically, where we all have patients bite into triple trays, if you're into that, for example, their natural bite. Okay, and sometimes um, sometimes you'll hear dentists say, uh, fluently, um, how could occlusion matter? Because when people chew, their teeth don't even touch. Hmm. What would you say that? I mean, you, you've heard dentists say that before, haven't you? Now, granted, they might be watching a football game and have already had four beers, but they do, they do say it. Well, who says their teeth don't touch? There's old studies that claim that they don't touch. What happens when we sleep? The way I look at it, neurologically, central nervous system tries to make up for discrepancies between the bite itself and the joint's condition, okay, when we're sleeping. We brux, we parafunction to dial things in. In other words, the hinges are a little messed up. Every night we sit there and we clamp down. We tip, we intrude into bone, we do whatever we need to do to dial in the way the teeth come together based on the hinges. So the bottom line is this, maxilla and the teeth connected, consider that a door jam. The mandible with teeth connected, consider that a door. The two TMJs, consider that hinges. If you jack the hinges up a little bit, does it make sense that the door and the jam don't quite fit right? Now how would you jack, jack the jam up? Well, or excuse me, the, uh, the hinge. Basically, this is going to get a heady now, but there's cartilage, and the cartilage is a disc. You have a lateral aspect towards the outside world. You have a medial aspect, deeper, half of the disc. The lateral aspect has little ligaments holding in place, and so does the medial. If one rips those ligaments, guess what happens? It tears out the cartilage to different positions. If you do that, there's one to two millimeters that's now variable. So let's say I rip my right joint. My mandible muscles pull things up a little bit further, and all of a sudden I smack my posteriors on my right side more than I did before. And guess what that does? It increases my disclusion time. It increases the amount of time that I'm on my back teeth, and thusly increases the hyperactive muscles. Now, if that patient becomes adapted over time to that condition, and how does one do that? One pair of functions, one clenches and grinds at night, one's breaking teeth if that's what needs to happen or tipping teeth, or intruding teeth, or creating diastemas. Or depending upon the cartilage condition, for example, this is getting heady, a 12 o'clock position, which is slightly torn. You ever seen the patient where the lower anteriors are worn to nothing, and you've got secondary dentin showing up? That's why that happens. They have a 12 o'clock disc, unilaterally or bilaterally. Basically, that increases what's called vertical joint dimension, separates the distance, makes this distance greater, and there's a little sling going on from the muscles, and they hit their front teeth harder. And then central nervous system feels that through the sensory organs that are the teeth and responds with a, a, a very heightened muscular response, get everything worn down, and that's why they present. There's all sorts of practical application in this stuff that we're dealing with here. And I know this is getting pretty heavy, heady. I'm not trying to make it a, a confusing matter, so please temper me if I make this too, too, uh, too difficult to understand. You're doing great. I, I could listen to you all day long. Um, a lot of dentists are, you know, money's the answer. What's the question? They have an old uh, school 2D pano machine uh, where when you and I bought our first pano, the, the hot new feature was someone figured out how to put an R on one side and an L on the other, and we yeah. thought that was the greatest thing in, in oral radiology. Do I really need to invest in a CBCT, a 3D x-ray machine, or could you do what you do with a 2D pano? 
you cannot, you can't do it properly. Uh, there's too much distortion in the Panorex. Um, CTs are readily available. You know, if, if the, the young doc can't afford it, hook up with an older doc that has one and pay him for the reading. I send off for MRIs to imaging centers all the time. You know, dentists are a little too, I don't know, myopic, I guess. We're too worried about what we have in our practice when the reality is Dr. XYZ, your buddy in your study club, the other side of town, if he has a CT, call him up and let him make the money on the CT. Who cares? The point is you need that information. And the CT is unbelievably useful when you start looking at the joints if you know what you're looking for. And it's extremely practical. And uh, it, look, I, I wouldn't practice without it, to put it quite did, did you Did you buy your own or do you use a CBCT uh, center? I have my own. And which one did you get? I presently have the Serona XG3D, the small, I think it's an 8x8 eight eight centimeter, which is reasonably priced. It's about 100000 I think nowadays they're a little bit cheaper. I've had mine for almost four years. Um, if what I what go, were the numbers on that? Serona what? XG3D. XG3D. Yes. It's a pano slash medium field of view cone beam in one. And it's great for implant planning and all that cool stuff. Um, the problem with that unit is it's a, such a small, it's not small, but it's a kind of medium size. You can't grab both joints. So if I had to do it all over again and money was no object, I probably would have had an instrumentarium ICAT Flex or a Serona Galileos because it's a large field of view machine. It would give me both joints simultaneously. With the XG3D, you can only shoot right side once, and then you shoot left side another time. So that's that's a quick tip for someone who hasn't spent the money yet. It's worth the extra twenty or thirty thousand probably to get a big machine, in my opinion. Okay, you talk a lot about frictional dental hypersensitivity (FDH). Frictional dental hypersensitivity. What is that? It's a functional explanation for all the occlusal sensitivity that we all see in practice every day. Basically, here's the story. I'll go back to the story I was telling you originally. Kirstein's sitting up there in the ACCD lecture, and I'm listening to him talk. I purchase a T-scan a month or so later. I start reading the heck out of his disclusion time reduction therapy papers. I start applying it in my practice. It starts working. And then all of a sudden, I decide I'm going to go ahead and spend the money and add the EMG to it because the T-scan will slave to the EMG, which is the muscle component. So in 3,000 of a second increments, I can look at how the teeth are coming together, and simultaneously I see exactly what the surface muscles are doing, the master and the temporalis. Temporalis and master, basically, right? So I can see with every 3,000 of a second increment, not only what the teeth are doing, how they're interacting frictionally with one another, but I can also see the resultant muscular output with the EMG. So. Robert tells me, Robert Kirstein told me, he's like, Nick, you're the only dentist in the world who's actually practicing DTR. And I laughed at him, and I said, that's impossible. And then about two months later, I call him up, and I'm like, hey, Robert, have you ever noticed that after we do DTR on somebody, initially when we first hit with the burr and the water, their teeth light up, and then the sensitivity goes away? He goes, ah, kind of in passing. I never thought much of it. But he's a prosthodontist and a researcher. I'm a general dentist who's out there like the rest of us doing this every day. And I'm like, Robert, it's happening. So he's like, hmm, let me think about that. So a month later, he gives me a phone call, and he's like, I've been sanctioned to write a, uh, a first edition textbook on digital occlusal analysis. I want you to write about that topic. And I was like, I am not an author. I'm not a researcher. I don't have time for that. I've got a busy general practice. You know, my wife's going to kill me. What's it pay? He goes, nothing. And I'm like, she's going to kill me. <laughs> Anyhow, long story short, I gave in, and I spent about 14 months scouring the literature, medical and dental both, looking for a reason as to why one's teeth would be less sensitive after we perform DTR therapy than it was prior. And I can go into that if you want me to. It's pretty heady stuff. But basically, Please, please. All right. Okay. In 2008, there was a researcher by the name of Lynn Swanot in Australia, University of Melbourne. He and a couple of his compadres at the university are trying to disprove the hydrodynamic theory with the dental flu uh, fluid flow that we all think is so correct. Brandstrom and Anstrom in 1964, right? Basically, you have to pass through the outer enamel into the dentin to activate the tubules, and there's a flow. 
and that stimulates the uh, the pulp. That's the theory. So we have all the sensodynes and all the you know dental occluding materials and what have you, and desensitizers, and that's supposed to you know stop the sensitive tooth flow. Well, Lin Swanot, the Australian guys, they basically used very very high tech finite element analysis technology to track the amount of time it took for a cold stimulus to hit the outer enamel, pass through the entire enamel, and hit the DEJ. They found that long before that impulse, before DEJ could possibly feel the differential in, in temperature, the pulp already knew things were going on. They proved that definitively. And they basically, they basically found that there was a, a biomechanical strain, like a flexure. It's almost like you ever seen metal being held very firmly between two vices, let's say, and you hit it with a blowtorch and it bends. You walk away for a day, it comes back to normal. You hit it with liquid nitrogen, it bends the opposite way. This is what they, how they were trying to uh, describe it. They call it strain deformation. So all of a sudden, that's just information. Same year, 2008, Japanese researcher, his name was Kubo, K-U-B-O, and his compadres from Japan, they're doing research on something called the A-beta intrapulpal fiber. When you and I were in school, and I'm sure the kids graduating nowadays, we learned about A-delta and C-fibers intrapulpal, remember? The A-delta is the myelinated fast pain to the CNS. The C-fiber is the dull, like chronic toothache pain, unmyelinated, slow pain, right? Well, it turns out there's an A-beta, and none of us learned that, and most of us still don't know it exists. But in 2008, the Japanese proved in vivo in human beings that the A-beta fiber is not only present in the human pulp, but it's directly connected to what's called the somatosensory cortex. Remember neurology? Remember that bizarre representation of like foot, hand, lip, penis, and all that crap along the side of the brain, right? Well, the A-beta is connected to that. So I combined Lin Swanot, the Australian, with Kubo. That was the best plausible explanation I could find two years ago when I was looking into this. So basically, not just necessarily a temperature differential, but a force differential, which we're measuring with the T-scan and the muscle, right? I'm looking at muscle and force and time. So if things are heightened and I'm flexing a tooth too much, I can activate the A-beta. And I can basically get uh, somatosensory cortex, which, by the way, is the autonomic nervous system, not the trigeminal, lit up. And I'm responding, and I'm flexing the tooth too much. I perform DTR. I start reducing the flexure of the tooth because I'm not flexing it as long in time. And guess what goes away? The hypersensitivity. So Robert asked me to do research, and I put up a pilot study in my practice, and we basically tracked 34 patients whereby pre-DTR, we handed them a glass of ice water, and post-DTR, we handed them a glass of ice water. And on a visual analog scale, 0 to 10, we asked them, how sensitive are your teeth? The typical muscular TMD patient said pre-DTR, ah, 7 out of 10. It, I don't like it. It hurts. I always ask for a straw at the restaurant. And then an hour, hour and a half later when I'm done with my DTR therapy, I give them a, another cup of ice water. So swish, how sensitive are your teeth? What would you do? It's gone. Give me a number, 0 to 10. 1. I feel it, but it doesn't hurt anymore. So... Bottom line, you reduce that excessive torsional flexure on posterior teeth over time, something that ribbon, shimstock, wax, CR, splints doesn't give us. You start putting a number to things, you can start affecting changes that everybody thinks are impossible. So in closing, the FDH thing, the last year I put together another study, a formal one, that Robert and I and John Radke, who's a researcher, um, friend of Robert's. The three of us are publishing a paper in uh, Cranium. It's been submitted for publication about, a, uh, what, two weeks ago. should be out by the end of the year, where we tracked 100 patients and proved statistically that not only did their disclusion times reduce, but their, their FDH scores did as well. So their cold water swish went down statistically across the board 100 times. Now, you, uh, you've mentioned this T-scan uh, from TechScan, correct, out of Boston? Yep. And, and are, you, are you a big fan of that? I can't do what I do without it. Well, we'll talk about that. I mean, what, what percent of the kids walking out of dental school, 5,000 graduates, what percent of them do you think ever saw it or used it? They probably don't even know what it is. Right. So will you – so – and most – all the evidence we have from our podcasters, they're all under 30. So uh, 
Right. Uh, we're we're probably the only two 50 year olds on, on the show today, and uh, so explain in detail what a tech scan is, and sure. and I know all about that. All right, the tech scan corporation started, I believe, in the late 80s. It was basically a prosthodontist out of Tufts University. I think his name was Manis, and a friend of his that was an MIT engineer, and they decided they wanted to try to see if they could create a sensor whereby they could, they could track force per unit time in the teeth. So they set, it, they set out to do that, and they did just that. It took them a few years. And Manis happened to be Robert Kirstein's um, uh, supervising faculty when Robert was doing his prosthodontic residency. So Robert had this cool new gadget sitting around. And Robert took a huge interest to it because he had to write his master's thesis, right? And he starts playing with it. He starts realizing over the years that there's something very, very serious going on here and when we time the human bite. But the tech scan basically... It's a handle, USB plug in. It has a cord. You plug it into your PC. Your, your PC is loaded with software that's networked throughout your entire office. You input data, including the mesial distal widths of the two central incisors. It extrapolates from there. You also input, like, if teeth are missing, if a tooth has a crown, things like that. And basically, you insert a sensor that costs about $10 into the T-scan handle, which is reusable. I, my oldest one is eight years old. I still use it. It works great. So it costs about ten dollars a usage. The, the handle itself costs about ten grand with the software. So it's a hefty investment, but it pays for itself in a normal practice in my mind in about a month. Okay. But the reality is, when you insert this sensor, you basically it has it's about a hundred microns thick, and it compresses and there's inks and circuits in there. And when you hit about 8 to 10 microns, all of a sudden it starts sending ele electrical pulses throughout the circuitry, and the software interprets that as to how much force per unit time is happening in a given location. And it tracks it in 3,000 of a second increments. So if I bike down and move off to an excursion, like in about a second, I have probably about 400 frames to study on my computer, and I can track those events. Now, here's the really cool thing. When I insert a crown or an implant, you think I'm going to trust the paper? The paper is 20 or 30 percent accurate. The T-scan sensor has been shown in the literature to be 95 percent accurate relative to force per unit time measurement. So all these patients that keep coming back, that's how the T-scan pays for itself. Forget about TMD world for a minute. Just buy a T-scan because you're a GP. You're not going to have those return visits as often. And if you do, you can actually track something and you can blow the patient away because their last dentist didn't know what the hell they were doing. They're using this archaic typewriter ribbon, which is basically what articulating ribbon is. If you think about it, I mean, forget what we think we know and what we were taught and what all the philosophies tell us about paper. It's ink and paper. Sensor or paper and pencil. Typewriter, Microsoft Word. Where am I going to go? So the point is the tech scan is integral to understanding occlusion and being able to affect changes that most people think are impossible. So in my mind, a new grad, honestly, I think that's more important than even getting loops or fiber optics on their handpiece if they're just opening their brand new practice. That one piece of equipment that in the great scheme of things, 10,000 bucks is pretty small if you think about it. Um, that will save their butts so many times I can't tell you. That's my take on the tech scan. And, you know, I love this stuff. I, and there's nothing else out there like it. I almost wish there were. But there isn't, so we're stuck with one company. Okay, now talk about switch over to uh, muscle measurements, EMG. Sure. Um, and, and again, what percent of the kids graduating from dental school have ever heard of uh, EMG muscle measurements? Oh, I don't know. You tell me. I'd say we probably all heard of it, but that's something a neurologist uses, you know. But the reality is, another company, not TechScan, a company called Bio Research. They got together with TechScan about 10 years ago, and they, they actually melded their electromyography unit, which basically you put them some surface electrodes, it's like tape, parallel to the muscle fibers on the temporalis and on the masseter. You put little clips on it. It goes to a box. The box has a USB cable you insert into your PC, and there's software that interprets. And you basically, it's almost like, think of it like a tachometer. So when I clinch or open, or clench, or just keep my teeth apart and rest. It's like a tachometer. The, 
The software is showing me exactly how many microvolts are coming out of my muscles of mastication. They're superficial. My anterior temporalis and my masseter. So the really cool thing is when those two companies got together, they were able to sync the sensor that studies force per unit time on teeth in 3,000 of second increments with a muscle measurement technology to where they're simultaneous. They're slave to one another. So when one bites down, one not only gets force per unit time, one also gets results in muscle activity. And that's when you start really understanding what DTR is, when you start practicing with that and seeing that. Now, that's not something I do on every crown and bridge patient or every comp exam. Those are only, I only pull out the electromyography when I really need to know what's going on with their muscles, when there's, you know, there's evidence of a muscular TMD issue or worse. So, so and very important. I love what you say, uh, measured, measurements matter. You, you say measured matters or measurements matter. matter. The, CNO, the CNO motto is measured matters because let, let LVI and Dawson come at me and the rest of us at CNO, our answer to them is going to be measured matters. We have the research. We have 30 years of it, and we're adding to it daily. So would you say those guys are each on a different side of you? Uh, Dawson, you said Dawson yeah. and Dickerson? No, no, you know, I have nothing against them. I mean, right. we're all – I'm not trying to insult. Believe me, it's not that. It's, it's more of instead of being dogmatic – Open our minds. You know, typewriter, Microsoft Word. You know, there's a number. I mean, I can get some things done so much more efficiently if I can put a number to it. But, but Whereas, ex explain more in more detail where you are versus where, say, uh, Peter Dawson is or where uh, Bill Dickerson is. Well, we're measuring about 20 different things. They're measuring – I mean, no offense to them. It's, it's all kind of subjective. It's based on a pain response. The reality is what really matters is not so much the pain, it's the condition of the joints themselves and the amount of time that we're on our posterior teeth, the disclusion time, because that's what sets off the central nervous system to either um, be happy and healthy and efficient or be very, very inefficient, ischemic and painful. So how we're, where we're at relative to those other groups, now the LVI people are using EMG, and I, I applaud them for that. I think that's great but they're not measuring the joint and they're not measuring force per unit of time. So the CNO, what we're trying to proffer and teach is, Hey guys, you got to measure this stuff, put a number to it. And guess what else? You got to measure this stuff, pull out your CT data. We're going to teach you how to read that. We're going to teach you how to decide if the patient was hit at age nine or 10. If the condylar surface area is deranged, if they have an osteochondrosis, Hey, look, there's an AVN. You ever seen an AVN? I've seen two in the last month documented with MRI. And no offense to the Dawson and LVI people, if they're not looking, they're not seeing that. In my practice in particular, I image everybody before I touch them with occlusal therapy. That means CT and MRI. And guess how much I make off of MRI? Zero. The imaging center makes their money off of that. I don't even charge to interpret. By law, the radiologist has to interpret. But guess what? Mark Piper himself taught me how to interpret. And I've spent a lot of time learning how to bone up on that because the radiologists, sadly, don't really know what they're looking at because almost nobody orders imaging of the, of the TMJs. And that would be our profession because why aren't we doing it? It's kind of like I imagine 70 or 80 years ago when x-rays came out, I, if we had this technology we're talking about radiographs, I'm sure most of the dentists would be like, I don't need no x-ray. My patients are fine. And nowadays, it's standard of care and ludicrous and malpractice if you're not taking bite wings periodically on people, right? MRI, same thing, but even more profoundly important because the orthopedics completely change how door and jam come together, maxilla and mandible. So you're getting me fired up, man. Well, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing. Look, I want to make peace with everybody. I want us all to work together and forget so much about the almighty dollar and worry more about the patient, helping them out. And if you treat people right, you'll make your money. And you'll be known as the person that can do it, whereas everybody else in town cannot. And if you can't fix them with what we're doing, you know enough to identify that that needs a TMJ surgeon, for example. And to know what it is that a TMJ surgeon does, when it's indicated, why would it be needed? When is, when is a joint replacement indicated? God forbid. Almost never. Why would you not want your patient to have a joint replacement? 
That's what we want to pass on. What's a fat graft? Um, what's a disc repair? Uh, what's a rib graft? What do these things mean? We weren't taught this stuff in school. You know, this is like me speaking Greek, right? No pun intended. But Yes, yeah, you are Greek. That's funny. Yeah, right. But the so, point is me, the measured matters thing, I, I thought that up about a year ago. I've been working on this well over a year, and it makes total sense. In two words, I can tell you what we do. We measure everything that we possibly can. Our minds are wide open, and we're trying to find other ways to measure and make things far more efficacious and predictable. Now, I want you to be very honest and come clean. You're Greek. How many times a week do you use Windex in your office? <laughs> I don't use Windex. <laughs> Come on, I saw the movie Big Fat Greek Wedding. <laughs> I break place every now and then. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you like that movie or did you think it was racist? Uh, there's too many nicks in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> too, too many nicks in the movie. I want to ask you something else I, I hear Dennis say that's very, very controversial. They say – um, how do you, I mean, what, what's going on with orthodontics? They, they walk in there with a Curva B, a Curva Wilson, and yeah. you're, you're flat, you're, 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 you're changing the whole everything for, uh, aesthetics. And, uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? And what, what do you, what do you think of the general pre-occlusion, post-occlusion for all the American kids who are sent to the orthodontist for two years of ortho? You really want to know? I do. Hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. This is dentistry uncensored, so let her rip. All right. No offense to the orthodontists and the oral surgeons because we're – and I don't claim to know more than anybody because the more I learn, the less I know. You know what I'm saying about that? Absolutely. Yeah. So – Why you play those last words? I don't know. I can tell you that I'm dumber now than I was five years ago, and I'm going to be a real dumbass by the time I'm retired. Because there's a bigger and bigger forest, and I never realize how big it is until I take the next step. Plato was another Greek like you, and his last words are, I know nothing. Yeah, basically. He learned so much, he realized he knew nothing. My opinion is this. My opinion is, in the ideal world, and I know this is impractical, but I'll give you ideal world. Ideal world, every child gets an MRI pre-ortho. Every child gets an MRI pre-orthognathic surgery. Um... Why? Because discs are displaced. I joint vibration analysis, every patient that walks in my practice, I've done so for over five years. I've done CTs on every TMD patient that walks into my practice for the last four years. I've done MRI on every TMD patient that walks into my practice over the last year. In the last year, I've shot 100 MRIs. I average at least two a week. There's a little over 100, actually. So with that data base that I'm compiling, I'm starting to realize, to answer your question, that about for every year or so of life, there's that percentage chance that they have a damaged joint. So if your 12-year-old daughter needs orthodontics, there's a one in eight chance that she has a derangement on her joint. And so what does it matter? It matters because you're jacking with the hinge and that affects how the door and the jam come together. And if you're not careful what you do down here, you can make the ligaments tear more than they already are. So how do the ligaments tear, for example? Well, did your daughter ever jump on a trampoline or play basketball or get smacked sideways with a kickball or your son maybe playing baseball or all these stupid things we do? We, we flip over our bike, we smash into the pavement, and you know, we cry a little bit, we have a little bump in our chin. Well, you might be living with a problem the rest of your life that you didn't even recognize. So when you start getting deep into this stuff, I start seeing osteochondrosis. Osteochondrosis basically is where the growth center itself is disturbed through one of those uh, macro-traumatic accidents that may happen to us in life. So, in other words, I fall, I hit my chin. I'm nine. Let me give you a better analogy. I'm a nine-year-old boy. I live in Nigeria. My parents uh, make 100 bucks a year. I fall out of a tree. I break my arm. The growth center in long bones is in the middle. I don't have proper care. It never gets reset. So this arm never grows anymore. This one grows to full genetic potential, my other one. So the analogy is the same. The growth center for the TMJ, the downwards and forwards growth primarily happens up here in the joint. If one disrupts the cartilage, that disrupts the growth center. Let's say I only do it unilaterally on my right side. Well, my left side keeps growing, but my right holds back. Guess what happens to midline? Guess what happens to muscles? They're supposed to be symmetrical. Guess what happens orthopedically? Guess what happens to teeth? So the orthodontist goes in there or the oral surgeon 
blind to what's going on with the soft tissue, which is the cartilage. Think about that for a minute. Panorexes don't show you squat with cartilage, neither do CTs. CT might show you spacing, but at what, what bite position did you take the image? All this is relevant. The only way you can see where the cartilage is is with an MRI. So when you start adding that to the mix, all of a sudden the occlusion and TMJ thing really does matter. So the orthodontic scenario, do you do that for every patient? I know that's impractical. No. But you learn, you learn to look for clinical signs of potential problems like asymmetry and growth, a changing bite. The patient that's in ortho for more than, say, two and a half to three years, that's a red alert in my mind. Why? Because things are breaking down up here. So you're trying to straighten all this out, but if the hinge is jacked up and it's melting away, for example, or the cartilage is tearing even further forwards, you got a problem. So the bottom line is it's impractical, but in the ideal world, if this was heaven, there were no economics, everyone gets an MRI. All my patients, I'm always looking at them before they go off for the ortho. Now, I'm not ordering MRIs on every one of them, but I'm looking at midlines. I'm looking at incisal edge position. Here's a little pearl for you. This is super important, and we can all integrate this tomorrow in practice. Every exam I do, find an MIP, slide straight forward, have your midlines lined up, check for clearance in the vac. Let's say, like right now, I have clearance back here. My posteriors are separated. That's an indication of it's likely that I have good cartilage here because if you know the anatomy, you'll understand that there's a thickness to cartilage, and when you – Go into an excursion, you're actually walking along the lateral pole. If you remove the lateral pole, let's say I'm tore on my right side and I protrude, there's no space back here that there is here. Guess what I've likely got going on? I've likely got a torn lateral pole or maybe even a medial pole, the inner half, which is far worse. This stuff gets really deep and heady. And who taught me these things was uh, Mark Piper. You know who Mark Piper is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dawson's oral surgeon. That man has imaged 22,000 plus patients in his career with CT and MRI. And I've trained under him, and he and I, we talk sometimes, and I've learned everything, I, not everything, but most everything I've learned from the backside, I call it, the joints themselves come from Piper himself. And by the way, Piper's no longer in the Dawson camp. Did you know that? I did not. You know, I know why. Why? He was confusing the students. Think about it. If you're confusing the students, why would they want to keep you on? You're, you're muddying up the waters. Because the reality is, here's, here's something that Piper, I knew this was true, but he confirmed it for me. All camps are right some of the time. All camps are wrong most of the time. If you're not imaging, you're completely oblivious. Your head's in the sand as to what's going on back there. And you don't, you don't appreciate what's going on back there as being important until you realize when you measure how it affects the front. And basically the T-scan and the EMG lets me measure front very, very well. And the backside, the CT and the MRIs are called the backside, the joints themselves. That gives me great input into the orthopedic end and how that affects the bite and how that might affect their pain or their hypersensitivity that won't go away. So now you start to understand how, what FDH means. FDH is one of those little keys that we use to screen patients. Ask your family at dinner tonight. Have every one of them take a glass of ice water. Have them swish for five seconds. Tell me zero to ten, guys. Ten is kidney stone. Zero is nothing if it hurts. So your wife does it, your son, your daughter, whoever. And anytime, and this is very subjective, I know, but anytime typically that you have someone respond five, six, or greater out of ten, they likely have a muscular TMD issue. Now, assuming their joints are relatively stable and adapted or normal, if they're really lucky, you've performed ETR on that patient. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow night at dinner, you have that same family member swish. They'll say two out of ten, regardless if they have exposed dentin or not. And I know that sounds hard to believe. There was many patients I've worked on over the years where they had recession and exposed dentin, and I reduced their score and over an hour's time, and they'd come back six months, a year later, and they're swishing at their recall appointment, and they're like, I eat ice cream now. I don't have any problems with that. So that's what FTH is. That's what the imaging means, and that's why I keep telling you measured matters. You start putting numbers to these things, all of a sudden it starts blowing everything else away. And I'm not saying it's all right, okay? 
I'm looking for contributions, man. If you've got something to add to the plate, give it to me because we're going to add it to the curriculum. If we can, if you can give us something that we can measure and reproduce objectively, we're adding it to the CNO curriculum. So our minds are wide open. Bill Dickerson, Pete Dawson, let's all talk. I'm completely up. The American Association of Orthodontists, we'll talk. The oral surgeons, we'll talk. Let's all talk. Let's worry about the patient because that's what's important. Patients first. That's right. So a lot of dentists that are listening right now, when they think of TMJ, they, they work backward from the complaint. And yeah. the complaint's either going to be, I'm grinding down and wearing down my teeth, so yeah. they just take an impression and make an upper night guard. Yeah. Or um, I'm getting headache. I'm grinding my teeth and getting headaches, which seems to be, is it not true, about 9 out of 10 women? 9 out of 10 women versus men. Would you agree with that, or is that, is that too extreme? Yeah. I'd say 70% female. There's a reason for that, too. You know that, right? What is it? The is reason it? is ligament laxity in females genetically is uh, far more prone to tearing ligament than in the male. You mean ligament um, be, because they uh, have to uh, have their ligaments loosen up for childbirth? I'm talking ligaments that are holding the, the cartilaginous disc in place. Female ligaments are not as hardy as male, genetically speaking. So the female is more likely to tear the ligament that tears the disc that causes results in occlusal imbalances that can cause hyperfunction. Or if the disc is torn badly enough, the disc is actually jammed into the lateral pterygoid muscle chronically. And it's almost like you've got a piece of gristle in your bicep for years. I mean, that doesn't feel good. The kid is always there. You're taking a shower, you're sleeping, you're going out, you're doing whatever you're doing, you're working, you're, you know, imagine. That's what happens when you have a displaced disc. Over time, it starts melting away, but the muscle itself is foreshortened and things aren't normal. I mean, there's science to all this, man. And it's out there, and nobody's really clicking on it because we're all wrapped up in the old dogma that we learned in school. Or we ask our mentors, hey, I, I want to learn more about occlusion. Where do I go? And then they, they trust their mentor enough to pick one of the camps, the philosophies, and they just go there and... They invest time, energy, and money in that philosophy, so then they're indoctrinated, and that has to be right. It can't be anything else. It's always this way. No way, man. Once you start measuring back and front, you realize that it's variable. Every patient can have as many diseases as they pleases. Remember that old saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And believe me, man, I get people from all over the world to come see me for that. Indonesia, Malta, Spain, the UK, Vietnam. Uh, we have not Australia yet. We've got Sweden coming in two days. Um, I've had South Africa two times, um, Italy, every state in the U.S., I'm trying to think, except for Delaware, I thought about this the other day, Vermont, Maine, and South Dakota, I believe. And is that – do you think a lot of that also is because of how many YouTube videos you've created? I mean, it's got to uh... – yeah. You've got to be an authority under TMJ on Google. I mean, you have – how many – what do you have, 200 YouTube videos? We have two – I have live. I have 200. I have about 100 of them that are hidden that are getting ready for the CNO. Um, when I launch the CNO, it's going to – there's there's a lot of stuff sitting there latent. And basically, I threw the videos up about the same time that Robert asked me to write the chapter in the textbook because I saw how much pain he was in frustration for at the time it was like 23 years he'd been you know, banging on everyone's head and no one's listening so I was like you know what we're gonna bypass the docs we're gonna go straight to the patient so that's how I started dropping the videos up it wasn't so much marketing myself it was trying to tell the patient that hey it's not a panacea but there are times that this procedure may actually help you with your muscular TMD issue if you look at my oldest videos it's very crude you know and then in the very beginning, the first 10 or 15 videos or so, I got a lot of hate mail. And the hate mail was from doctors, from <laughs> surgeons, orthodontists, and general dentists. I'm a quack. It's malpractice. You're grinding on that good enamel. And yet these people are hacking down teeth and doing full mouth reconstructions at a given uh, treatment position that's not even confirmed. By the way, in my mind, not only should you image before ortho in the ideal world, you should image before splint therapy in the ideal world. And NTIs are actually a bad, bad thing the vast majority of the time. We don't have enough time to get into that. Oh, come on. You open that can of worms, buddy, and it's Sunday. So 
<laughs> Unless you got guitar lessons after this, I see your guitar in the back. I haven't touched that thing in five years. I'm too busy with this stuff. You okay, okay. Well, you, you got you got to uh, pontificate on NTI because it, it's pretty popular. I know it is. All right, an NTI basically separates your posterior teeth, right? All right. Proprioception. Remember the afferent response. Okay. Let me ask you a question real quick, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot. What are the functions of teeth? Most of us will say mastication and phonetics, right? That's fair. And if I say, okay, what else? And they really can't figure it out. Well, what if I told you teeth may be thought of as sensory organs? So these guys, my dentition, via trigeminal input or autonomic nervous system sympathetic input or periodontal ligament or what have you, there's proprioceptive and there's pain fibers, no susceptive things going up afferently to CNS. It's processed up here. And the efferent response is how the muscle comes out, right? So the NTI, basically, I believe, and I don't have, this is subjective, okay, what I'm about to tell you. I've never seen the paper, but I know it's true from what I see every day in practice. Every tooth is wired just a little bit differently. And once you hit premolar back, if you're engaging that too much in time, you're ramping up the muscles. When you're canine to canine on front teeth, on the anteriors, that basically shuts muscle down a bunch. And I see that routinely with EMG readings. So the NTI, how it's, how it's potentially bad, if you have torn cartilage either side, normal healthy cartilage, it's like a clock face. I can't show this in the podcast real well. Glenoid fossa, condyle, you've got discs sitting here, right? between condyle and condylar head. And this is anterior, and this is posterior. Well, in perfect health, my disc is gonna be at the one o'clock position when I'm fully seated, or an MIP, kind of. This gets confusing, okay? But the bottom line is, this is where cartilage should be. When it tears, it tears further forwards. If you're torn forwards, let's say to the 11 o'clock position, and you put an MTI in there, you're th potentially throwing things into more spasm and torquing things out. You're putting more strain on that already partially displaced disc and you can pop it further out. When you pop the disc all the way out, you cause inflammatory issues and all kinds of other types of problems that can cause some serious orthopedic problems in the joint, such as an OCD or an AVN. So in my world, I'm not saying I never use NTIs, but I never use an NTI until I've looked at the soft tissue with an MRI. And I know that most people are going to throw their arms up there and say, that's ridiculous. My patient pays $560 for an MRI. I don't think that's ridiculous. How much do they pay? $560. $560? Yep. Now, now, was NTI invented by Jim Boyd? Yep. Uh, uh, you, you, you ever talked to him about that? or? Nope. nope. No communication yet. Okay. Hey, so, so I, want, I want to go back. Again, uh, we're 50 over. The thousands of people listening right now are 30 and under. Right, right. now, here's what they're doing most of the time. And, and try to how, how, how do we go from here to where you're at? If someone comes in and they're grinding their teeth a lot, they just take an upper uh, impression and they make an upper night guard. And then when they insert it, they ad, ad, try to adjust it so all the teeth are hitting. If someone comes in and says, you know, I, I grind my teeth and I have headaches, same treatment. They, they take an impression and they make an upper night guard. Um, what do you think of, of that and how do they – go from doing just that to being more like you? They need I mean, to, but first of all, do you agree that that's basically what they're doing? Yeah, that's what 90, probably 8% of the world does. 98% of the world, right? I would say. And that, so that, so when, when you say TNJ to the 10,000 plus people you're talking to right now, they, they just say, oh, you have TMJ? No worries. I'll take an upper impression. I'll make you an upper night guard. What, what, what's your next question? <laughs> Yeah. So, well, so what, 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 what do you say to that treatment protocol? And if someone says, um, that's all I really know, what, what, what would I do next, Nick? You first embrace the possibility that if I can put a number to something and I can reproduce that event and it's objective and I can help them in a certain way that maybe I should start learning about this type of stuff, right? I mean, kind of common sense. To answer your question – all right, teeth are not only sensory organs, but muscles, posture, and teeth adapt. All right, 
So if I have torn up backside, if my car is a little tore up and it, my hinge is kind of messing up the way my door and my jam smack into one another, and all I'm doing is putting a piece of plastic in there, what if I told you nature's way of correcting that and adapting to a tear up here is through the dentition itself, intruding, tipping, or breaking teeth with resultant muscular hyperfunction because brain, CNS, sends down that efferent response through the muscle to change the way door and jam smack together relative to hinges. So one needs to understand that I've got to measure things first. I need to figure out what's going on with the hinge, and I need to figure out what's going on between the door and the jam in time. When I start putting timing in there, and I start understanding Kirstein's research with DTR, and I understand that as long as the joints are stable and adapted, they're not necessarily in perfect shape, then I can actually implement a permanent physiologic change through an occlusal adjustment uh, procedure. Whereas, in contrast, if I'm making a splint, first of all, the splint can actually damage the cartilage even more. This is getting heady. So that's kind of dangerous, but we're oblivious to it. Um, second of all, I, I need to... If, if I drop a piece of plastic or acrylic in someone's teeth, it connects everything. Whereas if I do not, nature tips and trudes and adapts the teeth tooth by tooth, one by one, to try to catch things up. So you've removed, basically, when you put a splint in that's full coverage, the adaptive capacity of the dentition to catch the bite up to the status of the joints. I know I didn't say that very succinctly. But bottom line, I put splint in, I have to catch bite up to joint, I've eliminated that um, neurological way that nature has provided for us via parafunction to stabilize these things. And how do I know I've stabilized these things? Because of Kirstein's research. When I'm off the back in half a second or less and on the anteriors on an excursion, bam, the muscles shut down. How do I know? EMG, objectively. The microvoltage pre-op is off the charts. Post-op, it's calm. So, I mean... I, uh, this is heady stuff, man. Well, it's it's heady stuff, but um, tell my homies how uh, – do you have all your YouTubes on one channel? Do you have a YouTube channel? Yeah. yeah. What, what's your YouTube channel? Uh, basically, type in DR Nick DDS on YouTube, D-R-N-I-C-K-D-D-S. That's your website, drnickdds.com. Well, that's the – yeah. That's or, your website. But if, you, but if you go to YouTube channel and put in DR Nick DDS – that's it. It'll pull up your YouTube channel. You'll see my, my Greek my Greek head, and you'll see about 200 videos. There's 100 case studies. I, I, my goal was to put up 100 different patients, and I finally hit my goal about two weeks ago. And I'm getting ready to speak at the uh, bio-research conference uh, next Saturday. I'm, I'm smack in the middle between Mark Piper and Bill Dickerson. There's three of us lecturing on Saturday. Well, hey, um, you've written a chapter uh, in the uh – in the um, first edition textbook on digital occlusion, handbook of research on computerized occlusal analysis, technology applications, and dental medicine, I would be so honored if you'd make us a course on Dentaltown. We put up uh, 400 courses, and they've been viewed over 600,000 times. So it would definitely be uh, a great reach for you. And I and it's and sure. when I when we talk to these kids under 30, when they come out of school, they're really not stressed about bonding agents and posterior yeah. composites. Um, they they, they say the same thing. They say, we got zero in ortho. We right. didn't do a single ortho class, yep. no business class, and, and now they, they want to learn more occlusion. In fact, I know what they're asking right now. They're saying, so, Dr. Yano, Yanos, am I supposed to go buy a $10,000 tech scan, T-scan, and if I do, how the hell am I going to learn how to use it? The CNO will teach you. The CNO will teach you at www.cnotmj.com? <laughs> I'm, I, I'm in the middle of creating the content for the website. Um, the CNO is going to have an annual membership, and we haven't decided on the exact number. But with that membership will come a plethora of data, including videos like how to hook up the T-scan, how to read the T-scan, how to move the lines on the graph, what it means, what disclusion time is, the basic stuff. The joint vibration analysis, which is another technology we use to kind of get a sense of what's going on with the cartilage. The poor man's MRI, I call it. How to use that, how to use the EMG, how to connect the EMG to the T-scan. All that kind of stuff is going to be offered on the CNO website. And there's also going to be bibliographies whereby if I'm a 27-year-old recent grad, I want to learn about this stuff and kind of maybe follow my footsteps or something similar, maybe even do better than I did. 
Because remember, the older I get, the dumber I get. The more I learn, the less I know. I want 100,000 of us going out there and contributing and thinking about this because I'm only one guy. And I've got a board of advisors that we're creating with CNO, but it's basically me. So all those videos I created on my own. You know, I edited them on my, on my own. I mean, man, my life has been revolving around this stuff for probably three to four years now. Actually, about four and a half, if I think about it. Nonstop, joint, bite, pain, you know, YouTube, chapter, publication, research. I'm getting burned out. But the bottom line is I plan on, before I croak, <laughs> putting up enough information, hopefully within the next few months, whereby if an individual joins the CNO, one gets access to that stuff from their from their laptop, and we're going to start having annual meetings once we get that together. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna. I'm, I'm hoping to change the world a little bit for the benefit of the patient and for the dentist because imagine if you have fewer problems post op, you have less of those disgruntled people that are wanting to leave your practice because hey, I didn't hurt till you put those fillings in, and hey, you dug the filling out again and it's still sensitive. What's up with that? Never measured the timing, man. They don't know any better because we're not taught that stuff in school. Put a number to it. Measured matters, right? <laughs> I can't believe we're over an hour. We're, we're at an hour and two minutes. Uh, that Measured Matters Center for Neural Occlusion with Dr. Nick Yanyos out of Arkansas. Nick, that was the fastest hour I think I've ever done. You have an amazing mind. Uh, I hope someday you make us an online course for Dental Town. I think it would be the best marketing you could ever do for the CNO TMJ, sure. because uh, there's 216,000 dentists on Dentaltown, and I can guarantee you, I've been on Dentaltown every day since 1998, and TMJ, TMD, I mean, they can't even agree on the name. <laughs> I, it, it seems to be the most uh, controversial part of dentistry. You want to know real quick? Yeah. TMD is about 50 different things, and we're all shuffling it into one thing. And when a professional calls this TMJ, that's like saying, hey, I've got elbow. You know, I got TMJ, I got two of them, so do you. And here's another thing. When I look at somebody on the street and I see a retrognathic mandible, you know what the first thing I think is? Class two, that person fell when they were a kid. I bet you they got headaches, and I bet you they're going to wind up with sleep apnea in their older years. Piper taught me that. And I don't just swallow any pill that somebody gives me. Based on what I see with my imaging and my studies of the front and the back, I see nothing so far to refute what he told me. Okay, well, you just you just grounded yourself and set yourself there because I was going to let you go, but since you mentioned sleep apnea, now you have to rant on that. I'm not going to let you go. Oh, man. You just opened a Pandora's box. You said sleep apnea, and I wasn't going to uh, – All right. You really want to hear? I, I, they they want to hear because the number one selling book right now at the uh, on the bookstore is Ariana Huffington's book on sleep matters. So patients in my office are literally coming in with a book. So sleep apnea, it's their patients are asking about it all the time. Okay. So sleep apnea, is it real, false? Is it related to TMJ? Okay, yes, it, it is. It can be. Um, when you realize that the nine-year-old can fall out of a tree or off his bike and thump his chin and tear ligaments, and when you realize that the growth center is up here between the glenoid fossa and the condylar head, once you rip the cartilage, that disrupts the growth center, akin to that scenario we use of the broken arm, right? Growth center in long bones is here. Growth center in mandible is up here, downwards and forwards. That mandible no longer grows to full genetic potential. So maxilla grows to full genetic potential. Mandible holds back. Hence, one has a class two situation that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Because genetically, there should only be about two or 3% of the population with that problem. But the reality is there's about 15 to 20% or more with a genetic, or they call it a genetic class two, when the reality is they had a uh, um, growth center problem. So if you think about it, all of a sudden they become annuities to dentistry. They go through ortho. They start getting pain once they hit about 18 or college years. They go through uh, splint after splint. They wind up with a bunch of root cows because the posteriors are smacking too much and the muscles are compressing the tissue and causing necrosis of the tooth because of the excess muscle force, etc. cetera. You get me deep and heady here. So 20, 30 years later, we're, we're about our age, and we start getting a little fatter in the neck, right? And the soft tissue that's all connected to the mandible, remember the mandible never grew to full genetic potential. It's held back. It was supposed to go here, but it's back here. So with that, it starts constricting the airway, and we're getting fat back there anyhow. So the soft tissue never got a chance to create that tongue bubble 
up here, which is measurable on a CT, and the, oro, uh, the oropharyngeal space back there. It's supposed to be approximately, oh, eight millimeters at the level of, I'm trying to remember, C3 or C4. So if mandible, think about common sense. Mandible never grew all the way out, and tongue and all the soft tissues connected to it, it's crowding the, the breathing, the trachea. I mean, think about that, what I'm saying. So the reality is, is TMJ related to sleep apnea? Now, who taught me that? Mark Piper. Have I seen anything to make me refute that? Not with all the imaging I've done so far. Am I 100% sure he's right? No, because I've not been looking long enough. Do I treat sleep apnea directly? Not really. I don't choose to go there. But every now and then I'll see a patient and I'll, in my head, I'll, I'll see a little red alert based on imaging. And I'll say, you need to go talk to your sleep doc and have them call me. And then all of a sudden I had one about a month ago. And he thought I was crazy because I wanted an MRI. But after I sat down with him for about 20 minutes on the phone and explained to him, he was humbled and he understood. He was like, oh, my God, that is potentially a part of this problem. He goes, what can you do for me to help oral orally? And I said, well, we can maybe build a splint where we pull things forwards, but that's going to strain the disc even more. It could perforate the retrodiscal discal tissues. We should do serial MRIs on her to keep a look at what's going on in the joint. You know, this, this stuff is really deep, Howard, and it's, and it's everywhere. And that's the scary, not scary part. It's, a, it's an adventure. And I'm passionate about it because there's so much application. And when you, I can't help everybody, man, but I'm trying my best to pass. That's why I'm starting the CNO. Why would I keep all this knowledge to myself? I want to spread it around. I want to help as many people as possible. I don't want people traveling 10,000 miles to see me anymore. I want them coming 10 miles away. I want to be Northwest Arkansas's uh, guide for that. I don't want to be the rest of the country and the rest of the world. It's getting old. I, I want to go fishing again, man. I want to spend some time with my family. So I'm Greek. I like to fish. You know, that was one of my uh, favorite vacations ever. My dad, uh, we grew in Wichita, Kansas, and we drove about six hours. Is it the White River? Yeah. Yeah, we, my dad and I you. went. Uh, Constantly. What's that? I'll take you fly fishing on the White River. Oh, my God. My dad took me there. I think I was 10 years old, and we went White uh, River. Now my sister Kelly uh, moved down there, so she lives in Fayetteville. Yep. She's about 25 minutes from me. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, uh, there's two states that I think are the most gorgeous that no one ever talks about, and it's Arkansas and North Carolina. I'd say you're right. I agree. Everybody's always talking about New York and California and all these other states. Oh, my God, Arkansas and North Carolina got to be the two most beautiful states. Northern Arkansas. Southern is pretty ugly, but northern is gorgeous. And northern, the mean per capita income within a mile of my office here in Rogers is 180000 bucks. The mean, super wealthy, Walmart, J.B. Hunt, you know, you think Arkansas, you wouldn't think that, but it's a little known secret. And uh, people from all over the world and country come here to work for Walmart as executives and what have you. And it's a pretty cool place. Well, I just, I just want to set the record straight with you on one thing. Uh, I want to set you straight on it. Uh, growing up in Kansas, it's the Arkansas River. It's not the Arkansas River. Like so many of you people say down there. Dude, I, I'm not from here. I've only been here a year. Yeah, so I, no argument for me. I'm not even a Razorback fan. I'm an Aggie. Okay. Well, hey, uh, thank you so much for uh, responding to my request to have you on the show. I wanted you to be on the show so bad, and I was so excited when you uh, uh, said you'd be on there. And, uh, and I also hope someday you create us an online CE course. I think it would be great marketing for your uh, CNO, TMJ.com. Uh, I wish more people could hear about you, and uh, I hope this uh, podcast does that. I hope an online C course does that. Uh, thank you for all you do, and it is amazing uh, how many patients. Uh, I mean, just go to your website and read your views. I mean, you literally have helped patients from every continent except for I haven't seen any penguins uh, posting from Antarctica. Yeah. You got to do one penguin. I haven't had Australia yet either, so. Okay. <laughs> or Antarctica. <laughs> well, hey, thank you so much for all that you do, buddy, and thank you for yeah. being on my show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And all right. Let me know when you come to the White River, we'll go fishing. Oh, my God. It was the best trout fishing in the world. Yeah. Will you visit your sister? You give me a buzz. Okay. I I'm will. Next time I see my sister, I'm calling you up.